All right, I think we are live now. Hello, hi everyone. Can you hear us? <laughs> Is there anybody out there? <laughs> Any immortal words of Pink Floyd? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so where were we? Let's just start from the top again. Yeah, we'll start from yeah, the top. top, the very top. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, our deepest, most sincere apologies for the many issues. Um, please let us know how the audio is. Uh, I can see that the visuals are fine, but the audio is the main concern. Uh, Kit looks at me like I'm brutalizing a dead horse. Yeah, well, I mean, our deepest condolences for what's about to come as well. Um, <laughs> I thought we'd just put it out there in advance. But, okay, so... Since we last spoke, the Wall Street Journal, um, that well-known uh, purveyor of Russian disinformation, uh, has published an investigation uh, based on an as yet unpublished US intelligence community assessment and anonymous briefings from security officials from several European capitals, whoever they are. Um, maybe it's those, um, the beef eaters outside the Tower of London, you know, the security officials. But the uh, it, it concluded anyway that Vladimir Putin neither orchestrated nor wished for the death of Russian opposition activist Alexei Navalny in prison two months earlier. Um, it, it, quite why this is coming out now, I don't know. And it's very, very, very strange. Um, what's even stranger is that when Navalny's death was announced, on February the 16th, um, there was an explosion of finger pointing and uh, accusations from Western figures and officials. Um, US President Joe Biden declared, uh, make no mistake, Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. And meanwhile, Navalny's widow, Yulia, um, accused Russian authorities of hiding his body um, as they were waiting for traces of yet more Novichok to disappear. Um, and she she made very very bold bold threats about how <clears throat> uh, we will tell you all about it soon. We will definitely find out who exactly carried out this crime and how. We will name names and show their faces. And yet, ten days later, on February uh, the twenty sixth, uh, Ukraine's military intelligence chief Budin oh sorry, no, I think he's an outright military chief now, isn't he? Budinov um, avowedly disappointed everyone by announcing Navalny had in fact died as the result of a simple blood clot. Um, the US intelligence assessments relied upon by the Wall Street Journal reached the same conclusions. Now, quite why, again, this confirmation has come out two months later um, isn't clear. Although what's even weirder is that Budinov would try and shut down suggestions that, the, that Navalny's um, uh, death was a murder. Because, I mean, number one, right, since the very start of the invasion of Ukraine, um, officials in Kiev have been demanding that the 300 billion in assets seized by Western financial institutions from Russian oligarchs be given to them for the purposes of reconstruction and, and purchasing ever more weapons um, and, and, and ammunition. Um, but even more curiously, the, the, these are the same elements, the Ukrainian government and Western spying agencies, who, since the start of this in February 2022, have been lying to us on a daily basis, yeah. um, often to an intelligence insulting degree, claiming, for instance, that Russia was at one point in Bakhmut fighting with shovels. Right. Uh, remember that? Um, and then uh, they also claimed that Russia blew up its own Nord Stream pipeline, um, which they spent a large amount of money and time constructing. Um, uh, but, but yet they don't want us to believe these same sources who told us all this rubbish that Navalny was murdered. They really don't want us to believe that. Um, that's very, very, very strange. Um, it's particularly strange given in the immediate aftermath of Navalny's death, there was a huge push to implement a quote-unquote Navalny Act, yeah. which would have given um, uh, the Ukraine all of the, se the seized Russian assets. So Budinov electively sabotaged this campaign to give Ukraine what they want and arguably urgently need. Yeah. Why? Yeah. This is very, very odd. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, I was so rudely interrupted by technical issues last time. Um, it was quite strange that at the forefront of this, 
uh, push for a Navalny Act was Bill Browder, who's this uh, extremely corrupt fraudster who made an enormous amount of money in Russia during the 90s when it was while it was being raped and pillaged under shock that a Western imposed shock therapy and then once he became persona non grata and Putin actually started enforcing regulations and rules and forcing people to pay their taxes um, he suddenly became an anti-Putin anti-corruption campaigner in the West um, he's very well connected there's a lot of suggestions that he has ties to MI, Britain's MI6 um, or the CIA and there was that documentary about him that it was attempting to paint a favorable view but as the as the documentarian learned more and more about him what was that documentary called oh that was but the the, the, Mag, the magnitsky act yeah. on the streams made by my, my my dear friend andre nekrasov who right. is a uh, leading dissident um uh, the russian um, opposition activist <clears throat> um yeah so the 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 um uh, the, 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 the crux of the film was that he wanted to make a dramatisation of what Browder claimed happened, which is that his companies were seized by Russian authorities in order to uh, pull off a 230 million tax fraud. And then his crusading friend and lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, uh, uncovered the fraud, what, uh, reported it to authorities, but was jailed and then tortured to death in prison for his courageous whistleblowing. Um, in reality, Magnitsky was a corrupt accountant. Um, who ended up in jail for assisting Browder's crooked financial schemes. But mm. um, Nekrasov set out to make a film about this and very quickly found that it was complete rubbish and lies. Um, and uh, Browder, it was meant to premiere at the European Parliament, but Browder had it um, pulled using lawfare tactics. And it's it, you can find it on BitChute and other kind of rather obscure video mm. streaming websites. It's not like online anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, the the cover up uh, continues to this day. But the, so the fact that he was involved suggests that there was a a, a very real sense that, that this would succeed. Um, and then Budinov sabotaged it again. Why? Um, in my latest uh, article for MinPress at, at its conclusion. Uh, I draw uh, the, the very clear, this is, to my mind, it's a very clear comparison. Um, our dear friend James Le Measurer, the veteran Britain, uh, British military intelligence operative and mercenary um, who uh, was heavily involved in the Syrian dirty war, mm. created the White Helmets, much beloved by um, Netflix and the uh, the mainstream media. This was an allegedly a humanitarian... And Israel. Oh, and Israel as well. Yeah, they were fond of them. They, well, they, they, you know, when uh, they were evacuated, they, Israel evacuated them out of out of Syria. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I gather that they're, um, they're, 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 they're living in a series of refugee camps now, kind of dotted around mm. like West Asia. Yeah. No one really wants anything to do with them. No. Um, uh, but but, but yeah, the, the point is, is yeah, so the White Helmets were presented as, the, as these uh, courageous humanitarians who rescued children from rubble um, from government, created by government airstrikes. Uh, the reality was a lot darker, mm. um, actually, in terms of what they were doing they were a, a a core propaganda construct of british intelligence that was concerned with sabotaging um official probes into alleged chemical weapons attacks yeah. and staging chemical weapons attacks uh, and there's videos of some of their members you know standing around and smiling as children are beheaded and and things of that nature i actually caught um was this maybe 2017 or 2016 um there was a uh a white helmets uh you know um what are those things called the uh impromptu concert at grand central station in new york city oh really and uh somebody who happened to belong to a communist party was um a violinist i believe and he was sent an invitation to um you know perform um, and so he he leaked that to the Communist Party, and um, I was invited as media to cover their disruption. So I filmed I filmed the you know the concert and it being disrupted with signs and chants and whatnot. And uh, you know three weeks later, um, they completely redid the audio. Uh, they put out the video. They completely redid the audio. Um, used super close up shots of all the you know performers because everything else was totally unusable but they blatantly deceptively edited what happened and it's like look if they're gonna deceptively edit things in grand central station you don't think that they're doing that in in syria yeah, you know? yeah that's that's that, that, that's that's amazing i didn't know that but the, i think that yeah the, in effect 
for many years during the Syrian dirty war, the white helmets were unimpeachable and yeah. they were like all over the media and um, they they held up as heroes of the quote unquote revolution, i.e., Western proxy war and regime change effort in Damascus. And um, when independent journalists um, started actually digging in, um, including journalists who visited Syria, actually started digging into this group, they they discovered this rather darker. Uh, side to them, yeah. Um, and uh, there were the, the international governments who were funding um, this. Th- th- this actually started looking into it as well and started backing off because it was quite clear that there was an enormous amount of money being sent to um, James the Measurer's Mayday Rescue Company, right. and it was not clear where it was going and what it was being spent on and who it was being given to. Um, uh, and so, uh, and there was also a stream of leaks from the OPCW, the Organization for the Pre- Prevention of Chemical Weapons, um, which showed quite clearly that the, 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 the White Helmets and the Measurer himself were involved in sabotaging or um, or influencing OPCW probes in order to trigger Western intervention in Syria. Right. So this all rather comes to a head in November 2019, when um, a, a very abruptly, he in, in the early hours of the morning, uh, he falls from the window of his very lavish apartment in Istanbul, where he lived with his wife, the avowed MI6 officer, Emma Winberg. Mm. Now, in the immediate aftermath of this, a large number of sources blamed Russia and claimed it was a Kremlin hit job. Uh, I mean, this was a pretty safe option at the time, as as it is now. Mm. Um, uh, the, P- Putin and and the and just Russia as this nebulous concept were being blamed for the weather. Yeah, like quite literally, yeah. they were being blamed for everything. And we were told that they were, they were weaponizing dolphins and all this other other yeah. rubbish, and and so this it was a safe bet to blame Russia for the measure's death. You could point to the fact that RT had done a lot of critical reporting mm-hmm. on the on the on the white helmets, um, and so one of the the sources that that initially blamed Russia for the measure's death is a, a long time BBC journalist called Mark Urban. He is, apart f- um, from uh, a time spent in the British Army when he was an associate and friend of uh, Pablo Miller, who was Sergei Skripal, the GRU defector's um, recruiter and handler and also neighbour in mm. Salisbury. Um, you just uh, coincidence. I mean, Urban, of course, managed to spend the year before Skripal was poisoned interviewing him at home in Salisbury but of course Pablo Miller had nothing to do with this I'm sure Um, anyway uh, so yes Urban is a very well connected quite spooky uh, mainstream journalist who's very well connected in western intelligence security and defence quote unquote spheres and he explicitly in a series of tweets stated that it it is vital to ascertain whether there was state involvement and he also added and this is extremely suspicious based on a former colleague, whether that's of Urban's or the Measurers isn't clear, told Urban that they knew the Measurers' apartment well Mm. and it was impossible to simply fall, inverted commas, this was in the tweet, from that balcony. And they strongly suspected foul play as a result. Um, Subsequent to this, these posts were deleted due to Urban allegedly receiving quote-unquote new information mm. um was that new information and the apartment MS- was remodeled yeah clearly. yes yeah, yeah that new information in my six officials saying mark what are you doing yeah you idiot right um because again uh, and thereafter we it, the the line that he'd committed suicide was stuck to and stuck to very rigidly and we have subsequently been told by a variety of sources including a a uh, libel and and error strewn BBC series called just called Mayday and also a very lengthy article uh, profile of the measure in the Guardian yeah that he was he was very stressed out due to Russian disinformation so the uh, the British Army veteran took his own life because Russian disinformation because there's naughty yeah. nasty Russians telling lies about him which are completely untrue um, and the point is is that uh, much like Navalny it would have been the safest thing in the world to just claim that this was Russia. The act of, but, act, but, but it's clear that the powers that be did not want the measurer's death being looked at as a murder. Right. 
much like it's clear that the, C- the CIA and the Ukraine don't want Navalny's death looked as a murder, looked at as a murder. So we must ask ourselves why. So just in the course of a month, it's gone from Putin murdered Navalny to there's nothing to see here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and <clears throat> yes, I might add that uh, following um, the measurer's death, the Turkish me- media. Um, published a number of extremely damaging reports. One one article suggested that in the days leading up to his death, James Lemezro and his wife Emma Winberg, again, a uh, long-time MI6 officer, uh, sorry Emma, um, the, uh, they fought violently outside a restaurant in Istanbul. Mm. Why? Uh, and then also another even more um, explosive um, article in the Daily Sabah, which is very much connected to the to the Turkish. It's Turkish, yeah, yeah, Turkish. Yeah. So it's, it's it's basically a Turkish government mouthpiece. Yeah, it stated that the measure, a quote unquote British spy, was likely running away from someone at the time of his death, and it had all sorts of other incriminating details, such as Winberg having changed her story repeatedly, mm-hmm. uh, acting very suspiciously, claiming to have taken multiple sleeping pills, but then. This, which had no effect on her, and she was. Uh, and then when when they burst into into their apartment um, after finding the measure of body on the floor, she was allegedly shoveling money into bags, mm. uh, which is precisely what you would do if you are in a state of shock and grief about the death of your the the the, the, the sudden unexpected suicide of your husband. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, yeah, the, the parallels are quite clear. I'm not sure what to make of it. Indeed, I, I would invite viewers to make of that what they will. But it, it, it is, to say the least, deeply suspicious that the Ukrainians and the US intelligence don't want Navalny, another Western asset who'd rather right. fallen from grace, who may have known too much, was not getting out of prison anytime soon, yeah. having flown back at his wife's insistence, that because you have a, a hero's welcome at the airport, um, something that I'm familiar with um, in my, <laughs> my home my, my home country of the uk those those counter terror police were very excited to see me yeah uh, like it was almost coming up for a year now but they but yeah the, so um again not not sure what to what to make of it but it's something to it's something i would ask people to look at and bear in mind because we're also we are seeing some movement on russian assets i believe at yeah the moment, aren't we by like this ongoing push to give the 300 billion stored in western banks to uh, uh, to Ukraine, um, which, it, it, regardless of whether you think it's kind of moral and fair because of Russia's invasion, and you can make that argument if you if you really want, um, it is entirely without precedent, um, and it, it will have, if it goes ahead, potentially massive repercussions for the US and uh, as the as capitalism's global regulator but also uh for the western financial institutions involved in um uh, handing this money over Alex the floor is yours so yeah we see a lot of movement happening at the moment on uh the attempts to um take the already seized russian assets and repurpose them towards uh the ukrainian military slash government if there is much of one left. Um, I guess that could be said for both of them. Yes, yes. Uh, so one thing I, I actually hadn't realized until uh, doing a bit of research for this episode is that the um, the bill for um, for the Ukraine aid that just passed the sixty one billion yes. uh, is actually nicknamed the Repo Act. <laughs> um, Brilliant. And basically, what it does is it. I mean, in addition to giving the sixty-one billion, it it pay, This is according to the Atlantic Council, in the words of the Atlantic Council, uh, the unofficial think tank of NATO, yeah. uh, paves the way. Official. It's very much official. Well, may, may, maybe I'm I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, it paves the way for the seizures of uh, Russian central bank holdings that have been frozen in the United States for more than two years, while also setting the stage for a more global approach to confiscating Russian assets. Uh, Western countries froze approximately 300 billion Russian assets following the onset of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. I love that, you know, all this time later, they're still going with the term full-scale invasion when it's so obvious that that's not what happened. Um, Yes, well, I mean... the, uh, The Kremlin has been unable to access these funds since... 
Uh, but they are still te- they still technically belong to Russia. The Repo Act could now make it possible to seize Russian assets and use them for the benefit of Ukraine. Only five billion of the overall three hundred billion is located in the United States. But the United States is setting an important precedent by taking a leadership position in the confiscation of Russian state funds. We should not expect any immediate action. The Repo Act obliges the White House and U.S. Treasury Department to identify Russian assets in the U.S. within a 90-day period and report back to Congress in 180 days. After a further month, the president is then authorized to seize, confiscate, transfer, or vest any Russian state sovereign assets located within the United States. So I think this is, uh, as the Atlantic Council pointed out, an uh, underexamined aspect of um, – of this Ukraine aid bill. Um, and I also think that like, it's, it's pretty silly because I think that, uh, when you take people that are for lack of a better term, members of the oligarchy, Hmm. uh, and then you start seizing their assets over, I mean, they they don't have a national allegiance really to to Russia. They never have, um, these people, regardless of where they're from, tend to be uh, only motivated by the by profit. And so, when you start seizing their money over geopolitics, uh, that I mean, if I were in that situation, I would start uh, being a lot more invested in the um, in the in the strength of Russia rather yeah. than the strength of. Um, my, well, I my, mean, one of the one of the ironies of this is that. Some oligarchs have, because when you're rich, you have uh, certain freedoms that poor people don't, um, have managed to get their assets uh, out of where they were stored yeah. and move them back to Russia. Um, this this is after Putin spending 20 years demanding oligarchs invest their money in Russia and not abroad and then refusing. So this is another hilarious boomerang of the, uh, the Western sanctions on Russia, yeah. which far from making the ruble rubble, as Biden... Um, boasted has um, resulted in in Russia being the biggest economy in Europe. Um, internal investment is at record highs, yeah, because of all of this net new yeah. money that's like sloshing around. Um, and I think as well that it is it has sent a very clear message to um, Rus- Russian elites that yes, that they are not welcome yeah. um, in the West. But more generally, I mean, you you mentioned that this sets a, the US sets an important precedent. I mean, it does set set a very clear precedent, which is it is possible for hegemons to willfully commit suicide. Sure, yeah. right, because the the way that this will be perceived by the uh, the the world's what top one percent is, well, if the US, for whatever reason, turns against my country, or indeed my government does something that the US doesn't like, yeah. they're going to, to steal my money. Right. And so while it's not, uh, it, it won't be easy, they will be looking for alternative means of storing their right. wealth and alternative um, venues for storing their wealth. Um, Russia and China are moving towards creating a parallel um uh, international financial well, system, and, 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 and they're, they're moving very quickly on that. Yeah, um, and Putin and, articulated that uh, in his interview with Tucker Carlson, just talking about the amount of foreign trades that were conducted previously to the sanctions um, in in dollars. Uh, I think it, he said down eighty percent or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but it, yeah. it's. Uh, the, the clip, no, the clips huge, around the figures huge, and now and huge. now there's been like a forty percent increase in in uh, trading in, in Chinese currency. So, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, also you know we have uh, simultaneous to the Repo Act um, mo- paving the way towards the seizure of Russian assets, we have the European Union. Um, this is another Atlantic Council article. Uh, the European Union has made progress on its conservative plan to tap into the interest income. Uh, but its own estimates say this will provide about $3.5 billion a year. However, Ukraine needs are much greater. The first tranches of the Ukraine facility, fac- facility platform agreed to by the EU, the $7.9 billion direct financial aid planned in the supplemental and aid from other supporters, all combined to provide enough for 2024. But what Kiev cannot afford to again face uh, is to again face cash flows similar to what it endured earlier this year um 
Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's talk of major financial institutions demanding Ukraine hand over um, <clears throat> and start repaying its, its debts to them, which might actually account for why they're, they're unfreezing it now, mm. because it's uh, it's a means of PIMCO and BlackRock getting their hands on ever more money, yeah. um, rather than any concern whatsoever for um, for Ukraine. Um, I mean, pretty it's pretty again money laundering operation as with as we discussed last week about the aid. Um, it's yeah, it, it, we we are on the precipice of the US doing something deeply destructive and, yeah. and uh, counterproductive. Uh, and I mean, as if the sanctions weren't already, you know, uh, uh, sufficiently seppuku esque. Um, so I mean, it, it 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 will be interesting to see how this plays out. I mean, again, much like the war itself, uh, <clears throat> the collapse is going to come gradually, then rapidly. And yeah. I think we've been kind of building towards that point for this this whole time, um, and then it will, it will start cascading quite soon. Yeah. Um, in, uh, uh, I'll play the uh, Christia Freeland clip. Please do. Um, so this is Christa, Christia Freeland, uh, the granddaughter of a Nazi, a Nazi collaborator who um, is well known for having attempted to whitewash that history. Uh, her grandfather, of course, fought against Russia in World War II. Um, and she is the uh, finance minister and vice prime minister or something like that in Canada. Uh, so very powerful official. Uh, I, th I think that it's generally accepted that it's not Trudeau running the show and it's it's actually her yeah interesting. Um, and here she shared that Nazi in the parliament but no. right right um so here she is talking about uh attempts to make uh Russia pay for the war in Ukraine let me just turn the Ending our own domestic legislative framework to allow the confiscation and the seizure of Russian assets. Lloyd has pointed to that. I'm glad we've done it. And I would urge all of us to get our legal frameworks in place. Um, I think we've seen some real progress there with the U in the U.S. And I do want to recognize the role that Lloyd has played, the role that Alan Rock, a Canadian former justice minister, has played, the role that um, Senator Ratna Omidvar, that's like our House of Lords, we have a Senate. Um, she has been playing a really leading role here, the role that Fenn osler Hampson has been playing. We have a real kind of... Um, a real team um, that has been working on this. Um, and I do want to also talk about Chatham House has been playing a leading role. I do want to say Philip Selico, Bob Selick, and Larry Summers have. Larry Summers being uh, the U.S. economist uh, largely responsible for the plundering of, of Russia in the 90s, um, good friend of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and an advocate of polluting uh, Africa, he's argued that it's um, it makes financial sense for the U.S. to dump toxic waste in Africa. So, and, and I'm doing just some important up, work in laying the uh, Freeland um, says that there will be more movement <clears throat> on on the seizure of Russian assets uh, at the G7 summit. Look forward to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just think that the, 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 it's one of those, I think you had a great phrase the other day, which is uh, death by a thousand self-inflicted cuts. Mm. Um, and I think that this, that this is going to be a very, very, very big self-inflicted self -inflicted cut. But it's one of those indications that the empire is just kind of, it's, it's on its last legs. It's quite drunk. Um, yeah. It's kind of looking, looking back on its life and singing, I did it my way. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like, you know, in the manner of Frank Sinatra. But you see all of these absolutely incredible um, developments in the news, um, like recently. So uh, there, there are Russian troops that are now uh, have moved into a, a base housing uh, primarily U.S. soldiers in Niger. Um, yeah, I think it was about a thousand U.S. soldiers um, under strict government orders left the country, and then they got replaced by Russian soldiers. So the Russian and U.S. forces are now sharing the same facilities. Yeah, um, for the time being, until the, time the being. until they're kicked out. Yeah, yeah. So that I mean, that in itself is uh, is really quite remarkable. Um, we have had. Um, uh, uh, reports in the Jerusalem Post that the much vaunted U.S. Patriot inter uh, missile interceptors 
uh, in based in Israel only stock twenty five percent of the, what Iran fired uh, at, uh, at Tel Aviv. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even if that figure is, I mean, that, it's doubtful that figure is even true. Right. It could be considerably more. Um, there, there is uh, a lot of talk uh, um, in the media about how. Uh, the, well, the, 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 there's a, there's a double edged sword when they when they talk about um, and you see this with Ukraine when they talk about the effectiveness of of Western supplied weaponry um, because if they underplay it they can make the argument that uh, it's not effective and that's why we need to give more money and if they overplay it well that's an obvious. Propaganda win and, and and probably a boost to uh, you know um, Lockheed stocks you know yeah yeah I so mean it's also it's I mean it's also a way of um, explaining the the crushing uh, impending defeat um, could you draw up the the Telegraph article at the bottom of this section in which a Ukrainian military intelligence chief. I think it's military intelligence. Uh, yeah, a Telegraph. Yeah, yeah. This is Ukraine peace talks. Yeah. So uh, Major General Vadim Skibitsky, the deputy head of Ukraine's military intelligence agency, um, said there is no way to win on the battlefield alone. Um, this is going to end in negotiations, and Ukraine isn't getting the territory it's lost back ever, uh, which is a pretty astonishing. Acknowledgement, um, you know, I, it, it, it brings me no joy to have said this from the very beginning um, at all. Uh, and uh, Mr. Sabitsky states, wars can only end with treaties. Um, I mean, I, I thought last last summer we were told it was a beach party in Crimea, but no, yeah. this is uh, actually the signing of a Any, a any treaty. day now. Yeah. I, th- I think this August is the deadline, if not parties cancelled. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, but, you know, d- um, d- don't, don't be overly cynical, because, you know, they've just got on that aid. So right, I'm sure right. it's going to tip them over the edge. But, but so, yeah, the, um, we also see that there has been a, a number of articles um, there was a, a, a particularly interesting piece in Business Insider. With, uh, it was an interview with a U.S. soldier who uh, fought in Ukraine from the start of this until the end of last year, who stated that his training um, in the U.S. military did not actually prepare him for war at all. Um, and the U.S. has forgotten how to actually fight wars because it has been focused on counterinsurgencies against quote-unquote guerrillas, and which is to say uh, people in typically in the Middle East and North Africa who take up AK-47s because they don't want the U.S. there. Yeah. Um, that's been the strategy. Well, we saw, we saw that in the beginning of the war when you had all these, uh, you know, um, U.S., Australian, British, French foreign fighters pouring into Ukraine and, and running there <laughs> and running, running away with their tail between their legs because they've, you know, their mental version of warfare was bombing defenseless farmers. Yes, yes, yeah, indeed, so, indeed. That, that, I mean, there was, there was that video that emerged at the very start um, of, the, um, of the war in Ukraine. It was like a U.S. military vet who was saying, yeah, like we didn't know we wouldn't have air cover. We didn't yeah. know that, that, we, <laughs> that we would be up against an enemy that actually had you know, sophisticated artillery. Right. Um, that was, air superiority. Yeah, and, 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 and air superiority and that, that, yeah. was, that was striking us with, w- w- without us getting anywhere near them. Yeah. Um, so there's, there, yes, this is all, it all seems to be coming to a head, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and I think that the, the um, you, you, you mentioned... Um, uh, the French Merc, I believe a French, it was a French Merc fighting in Ukraine who was the first to really, really go big on the fact that he was fighting alongside uh, hardcore committed neo-Nazis and right. he was shocked by the profusion of um, swastika tattoos. You've done an enormous uh, number of, of sterling work on neo-Nazism in Ukraine, Alex, so perhaps you would like to discuss um, the, uh, the role of right sector and as of another um, uh, fascist paramilitary groups in Ukraine. Yes, I mean, certainly. Uh, so, I mean, my, my ongoing argument is that the Western media for years, since 2014, uh, made an explicit effort. In fact, it would... It, it was quite clear that the media, I think, was getting direction from the intelligence communities um, to to cover these topics um, because they wanted at that point to uh, 
to have a, a, a friendlier face to the people conducting an ethnic cleansing in Donbass, and they didn't want the Nazi association. So they had the media hype it up in order to um, kind of uh, make a policy change in Kiev, yeah. right? Um, so here we have BBC um, 2014 during the Maidan talking about right sector. The most organized and perhaps the most effective were a small number of far right groups. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the loudest and the most violent. A group calling itself the right sector is perhaps the largest. Its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. National socialist thematic. Our general mission to totally ruin uh, chains that uh, connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And that being Russia? Yes. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi. I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. Uh, what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic, some political forces. And, uh, Which ethnic groups? Uh, uh, Russians and Jews and the Poles. It may be uh, every, some... Uh, Non-Ukrainian group control a huge percent of some economic or political power. And C-14 is affiliated with a political party called Svoboda, or Freedom, which now controls four ministries in the new government, including the Ministry of Defense. Two of its MPs were recently photographed brandishing well-known far-right numerology. 88 stands for the eighth letter of the alphabet, H-H. Heil Hitler. <laughs> but it's clear that it was the radical groups who kept up the pressure on Viktor Yanukovych, and many of them feel that this really is their victory. So there we have it. Uh, Yevon Kadas, the leader of C-14, as I reported early on uh, in uh, two years ago when, when the war started, um, Yevon Kadas and C-14 got uh, contracts with the Kiev municipal uh, government to essentially ethnically cleanse Roma people. And they chase them around. And there's videos of them tearing down Roma encampments with axes and, uh, you know, doing all kinds of uh, uh, fascist salutes. Um, Yevon Kadas, I, I posted another video years ago now um where he says that if it were not for the neo-nazis at maidan uh it would have been a gay parade so <laughs> um and and he said and this was just a, uh, this recording i'm talking about was just a, a month before uh russia uh launched the military operation so he says we wanted a war you know we have we like fighting we like killing um and 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 so the goal has been to um, you know, get rid of uh, undesirables, Jews, Roma, and um, and Russians in particular. Gays as well. And gays, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you go and if you if you, I think it's Open Democracy has extensive uh, reporting on um, on Azov, um, shutting down gay parades and beating people up in in Mariupol. But I think really Mariupol was the turning point in, in this because. Um, because it was Azov that for so long uh, was in charge there and was, you know, because of its location in uh, just, you know, south, southwest of Donbass, um, it was used as a staging ground for all the attacks. And it was, it was Azov um, as the tip of the spear. And so when Russia started trying to take Mariupol, 
there really needed to be a a, a whitewasher rebrand of Azov. Mm-hmm. And so that's when you started getting the heroic defenders of democracy messaging. You can you can pick up from there if you like. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think that it, I mean Mar- Mariupol is it, it, it's very interesting because <clears throat> um, p- p- people who uh, I deny or try and diminish like the repression in Donbass, they often point to the the fact that the civilian casualties in the conflict drop precipitously like um from from 2014 onwards and it's like they went from yeah. great many thousand to only a few thousand that rather like ignores possibly deliberately possibly just out of ignorance the fact that these fascist western backed and funded and armed and trained paramilitary groups like Azov, they yeah. ruled areas of, like maria Pol with an iron fist yeah like absolutely and the, a lot of their 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 work was it wasn't concerned with killing people. It was just instilling absolute terror into the local population. Yeah, and, and going after you know gay pride, going after feminists. Yeah, you smashing know, and, up Roma camps. Yeah, yeah. And, and and but not only that, it's also the fact that um, the, 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 they engaged in, in widespread kidnap because um, one thing that the uh, uh, the the two breakaway republics, the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics. Um, did was that they when, when they captured Ukrainian soldiers they would use them as hostages for trades yeah um, and then so in that context Ukraine needed or wanted people to trade so they would start kidnapping people um, off the street and right. saying well, if you want these people back then you have to give us our soldiers there was a UK immigration court I believe it was in July 2020 um, that, that this this obviously got no coverage whatsoever it there were two Ukrainian draft dodgers who were seeking asylum in the UK and the court found in their favor they allowed them to stay in the UK on the basis that serving within the Ukrainian armed forces would necessitate carrying out war crimes, right. including kidnap of civilians. Yeah. And uh, uh, and so therefore, uh, it was legitimate for them to refuse the draft um, as a result, um, yeah. and so, which is, um, it, it's quite remarkable, really. And recently, I think it was at the end of last year, there was a German, um, the, the evil Germans, um, there was a German broadcaster called ZDF, which um, they, they sent a team of reporters to Maria yeah, and there is a a two camera interview by one of the the reporters they sent, um, talking clearly in a state of mystification and bewilderment about how well it's a very peaceful city that's being rebuilt. People are going about their business. Uh, everything's very calm. There's no like military presence here at all. And it's like, well, I mean, do you get it yet? Like, you know, it's just that, the, 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 yeah, they were expecting to walk into some hor- horrendous. Um, uh, hunter style like right. a chili coup like in right. situation and no everyone's just getting getting on because there's no more as of uh, yeah <clears throat> they they all surrendered but i think it's important to note as well that on top of funding training and um uh, sponsoring these fascist paramilitary groups the, the, in turn these fascist paramilitaries in ukraine have sought to export their neo-nazism abroad particularly in europe yeah there is a group called centuria which is one of two allegedly separate uh, groups in ukraine that that, that sprang out of azov uh, both called Centuria, but nothing, that to right? do, nothing to do with one another, <laughs> a, a, allegedly. Um, one of these Centurias is uh, trying to put together um, uh, citizen armies um, across Europe and runs fascist youth camps where people do the, the Heil Hitler salute. And yeah. um, yes, young boys and girls go hiking together and I'm sure are indoctrinated in, in Mein Kampf. Uh, but then this other Centuria, is in, it, it, which sprang out of Azov, is involved in proselytizing neo-Nazism within the wider Ukrainian armed forces, but also major uh, Western uh, uh, armies as well. There is a, a, a extremely detailed and, and well-researched report that was produced in September 2021. At George Washington University, no, no less. less. No less. <laughs> this is, so this is what's absolutely astonishing. Is there is a, 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 a September 21 report by George Washington University Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies um, it, it, the report was written by a Ukrainian national living in DC 
um, who had previously written for US government propaganda network Voice of America Mm -hmm. and also produced work for the alleged independent open source investigative outfit Bellingcat, which as we know is actually funded by the British and American governments um, to endorse their narratives um, and give them the appearance of objectivity. Despite the fact that this author's pedigree and background, the report was completely ignored by the media. It didn't get any pickup anywhere at all, apart from the one article in the, in the Jerusalem Post. Now, if you could draw up the reports. Oh, it's, it's uh, been oh, up, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, um, the, I would uh, urge uh, viewers to read this because... Well, if, read Kit's article at the Grey Zone. Uh, you don't need to read the or, whole 93-page oh, yeah. <laughs> academic pages. paper. Yeah. But so, I mean, to give you an example of just, just one of the people featured in this and and they explicitly state that they are an, a, uh, an order of european traditionalist traditionalist military officers that ha- that seeks to reshape ukraine's military along right wing ideological lines yeah, where where whereas Azov was kind of like uh, comprised of like former soccer hooligans yes. turned neo nazis, uh, this was like at least the impression I get is Centuria was kind of more of an elite military grouping. Uh, started off as like you know maybe something like a secret society, yes, and expanded from there, right? Yeah. So Centur- Centuria. Um, it, it, they openly boasted on Telegram about how they, um, uh, con- their members had been part of Western military training programs and trained alongside um, Western elite forces, uh, military forces, and uh, Western military training institutions. Um, to give you one example of an individual cited in the report, there was an individual tied to Azov who attended an 11-month officer training course at Britain's esteemed Sandhurst Royal Military Academy starting in 2020. Um, This, I mean, Sandhurst is where the creme de la creme, allegedly, of the British Army are trained. The Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs celebrated his graduation very publicly and published this lengthy profile video of, of, uh, of this individual's path to military leadership. Um, and then the, the George Washington University report notes that he took a keen interest in uh, disseminating uh, Azov's absolutely repulsive neo-Nazi ideology while he was at, at Sandhurst, which included creating a prom- uh, narrating a promotional video for Centuria while he was there. He posted videos ab- about Azov <coughs> from Sandhurst, along with um, clips uh, documenting his daily routine there. Um, and uh, he also gave an interview to Centuria's te- Telegram channel um, in which he stated that he preferred training in Ukraine as British training for military officers put less less emphasis on theory. Oh, yeah. um, I wonder what type of <laughs> theory um, he was learning. But the, the, so, yeah, I mean, this is deeply insidious and disturbing. And once, very curiously, once the report's author started reaching out to the organisations and individuals um, and groups uh, named in his report, they all suddenly started deleting any and all trace of their online footprint, um, yeah. which was, of course, highly incriminating. And this included, you know, Ukraine's Ministry of Defense yeah. started a clean up job. So they understood what a problem this was. Um, and so. And they, they were uh, based out of um, a particular base near Lviv, I think. Yes. Uh, which was basically um, where the NATO militaries would come to train yes uh ukrainian soldiers um in the cia too yeah um pr- you know prior prior to the war um i have well i think i tweeted this some time ago yeah th- and this is from that same report but uh you have um some black american service members in ukraine training a member of centuria uh and you can see that he posted it on Instagram and tagged his location as Zimbabwe. Uh, not only that, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he posted 1488 with, with that same photo. So, I mean, even there, I mean, they're racist and disrespectful towards the people teaching them how to fight Russia. Yes. 
Well, of course, I mean, why, why wouldn't you be? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that just more, more, more generally, and I, I think we can skip to Georgia after this, but there, the, the, it is important to note that this is not an anomaly, this is not an aberration. Um, the British and American intelligence and security apparatus has for a very, very, very long time used um, nationalists as their shock troops. They have sought to... Um, uh, promulgate nationalism um, uh, across the world because it's a very good way of, um, of divide and rule um, and, mm. and they can also yes be turned turned into uh, spears heads against enemies like in Yugoslavia for instance um, right. the, the the West uh, started backing hardcore Holocaust denying Nazi venerating um, nationalist elements in Bosnia in Croatia um, uh, and uh, the, in in Ukraine itself, um, throughout the Cold War, they uh, the CIA and MI6, um, and also in the Baltic states as well, they had uh, close connections with um, uh, nationalist separatist uh, uh, elements there, and um, we see it, it, this is just a continuation of that. Um, this is no kind of blip in the radar. This is this is the norm, yeah. um, as it were. Um, funnily enough, uh, I mean, on the subject of hardcore, dangerous. Um, well, let's let's let's, let's, pa- let's pause. Let's pause because I, I have a few more things I want to say. Right now, I have a photo up of Centuria members sick sure. Sure. Um But I would, you know, I would just add that uh, that you know, for, for for the gray zone, I exclusively obtained from the Anti Defamation League. Uh, a whitewash of the Azov Battalion, um, you know, members of which uh, are linked to Centurion. You know, we could talk about Azov all day, <laughs> but um, n- no less Nazi than Centuria, right? Um, claiming that they've been reformed. And I've actually disproven that because they're, the basis for that claim by the ADL was that uh, Andre Beletsky was no longer associated with Azov Battalion and was merely the figurehead of uh, the National Corps, which is an Azov-linked um, uh, political party. Well, it actually happens to share the same office with the Azov Battalion. And wow. uh, not only that, but Beletsky is in charge of like a separate Azov regiment that's still Azov, but it's yeah. not called Azov anymore. Um, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, I mean, while you have the ADL saying people like this, the people on screen, Sig Holling, are reformed and yes. not a threat to Jews. Uh, any, you know, college student with blue hair is a raging anti-Semite, yes. you know, um, and poses a dangerous threat to the safety of Jews yes. across America. Indeed. So it's 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 just, you know, you it, I, I think stuff like this really um, reveals the uh, the cynicism of uh the of the ADL and of the Democratic Party. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, yeah, I mean, on the subject of on the subject of c- cynicism, um, we ha- in Georgia um, the battles over their foreign agent legislation continue apace, and the U.S., which has a very strict foreign agent law. Um, uh, is leading the charge um, against uh, the, the Georgia's efforts to re- regain some semblance of sovereignty. What, 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 what page do you want to... Um, go to Georgia Colour Revolutions. Um, are we actually live now? Yeah, I believe so. I don't... It says we're not, it says we're not live. Yeah. Hold on a moment, folks, if you're still with us. If you really exist... <clears throat> I believe that we are still alive. Yeah, we're alive. Okay, okay. Jolly good. Um, but yeah, if you just go to the section marked um, Georgia Color Revolution. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Democracy Rising or what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's a whole section on the Rose Revolution in, in 2003. Um, the, the, uh, the report you're about to see on screen was produced by USAID in 2005, and it's called Democracy Rising, and it talks about how, um, well, many people watched in wonder as the multicolored revolutions took place. The Orange Revolution in Ukraine, the Rose in Georgia, the Cedar in Lebanon, the Tulip in Kyrgyzstan. 
Uh, few realized that for years, the US and other countries and organizations had been supporting this homegrown desire for democracy. Um, so what this is, it, it, this is effectively a, uh, again, I, I, I did it my way, except this is kind of at the peak of, of US empire in, in 2005. Uh, it's showing off about how they overthrew government, uh, how USAID and NED overthrew government in the former Soviet sphere um, uh, using tactics that they honed against Slobodan Milosevic in 2000 in Serbia, um, in what's known as the Bulldozer Revolution, by sponsoring pro-democracy groups, um, uh, uh, activist causes. Um, uh, uh, they sought to undermine and destabilize and ultimately overthrow um, uh, existing regimes to replace them with neoliberal um, quote unquote democracies right. where, where, where the um, the US and its 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 Western allies could pro pro profiteer and um, <laughs> exploit uh, exploit workers. Um, as wage slaves um, for subsistence pay. Um, and Isn't it funny how every time a, de a democracy, a new democracy forms, it, it, it transforms into an oligarchy and yeah, you know, matter I mean, of it's remarkable, isn't it? I mean, there is a there is a USA report which is um, uh, it from I think I think it's from the year two thousand, which explicitly states that um, the US would not meet our definition of a functional democracy. So yeah. this is the a US government agency that exports democracy abroad, admitting that the US is not yeah. a um, it w uh, would would be con considered a dictatorship under its own under its own uh, definitions. But yeah, so I mean, this 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 report it's worth it, it's quite short and it's worth looking. Yeah, just I mean the, the hubris and um, delusion on show is quite quite uh, remarkable. But there's a whole section on on Georgia which provides a kind of uh, a useful uh, background to. Um, well, can, can, can I? I just want to talk about USAID real quick. USAID yeah. being led today by Samantha Power, who I have personally exposed, um, <laughs> meeting with. Uh, Speaking at a convention uh, sponsored in part by the Church of Scientology, um, alongside other U.S. government officials, uh, she's also I've as as I've reported for the Gray Zone, um, spoken at a rally organized by longtime fundraisers for the Azov Battalion mm -hmm. for Right Sector, um, other neo-Nazi groups, and she her motorcade uh, actually killed a child and refused to stop one. So I call her Samantha can't stop, won't stop power. Um, so, you know, when she comes, it's, it's generally uh, chaos ensuing. But USAID, uh, the U United States Agency for International Development, actually one of uh, their first things that they did was training, um, training Latin American police departments in Uruguay, I believe, yeah. uh, how it was all uh, over the region, in fact, right? Um, they they taught them to kidnap homeless people off the street and torture them. Yes, as guinea pigs um, for for uh, future interrogations, political interrogations. This is, of course, the uh, the agency um, primarily behind democracy promotion and, yeah. and well, the National and, Endowment for Democracy too, which is yeah, <clears throat> in the words of its. Founders and longtime chiefs does publicly or does overtly what the CIA used to do covertly. Right. So yes, funnel money to opposition groups in in foreign countries in order to destabilize and unseat governments. Um, that, but yeah, there is a whole section in this um, in the in in this democracy rising report yeah. that are on on Georgia and what happened there. So what's the title of that it's, of that section? Do you know? It's just called Rose Revolution, I think. Okay, but. Um, uh, th yeah, so um, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Georgia, Georgia was, of course, part um, of that. Uh, it was led by an individual called Eduard Shevardnadze, who was a he was a long time Communist Party apparatchik, but he was a right hand man of Gorbachev and heavily involved in the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union. He was, he was I think he was the defense minister in the last Soviet government and he withdrew Red Army uh, forces from Europe. He, he drew up all sorts of uh, arms control treaties um, yeah. with the US. And so he entered office in uh, uh, Georgia very much as Washington's guy. And yeah. Georgia started receiving an enormous amount of a of USA, I think it was only Israel was a bigger recipient than um, than Is that Georgia right? for many for many years. Uh, George Soros also took an interest in um, in Georgia, um, and um, it, because Shevardnadze thought that he was unassailable, and hey, you know these guys are my friends, he allowed an enormous amount 
of foreign penetration, both um, uh, commercially, but also in terms of NGOs. Like you saw, I think that Georgia has multiple NGOs per, um, uh, or sorry, it's like it's like a hundred Georgian citizens or some or hundred fifty <laughs> citizens to every NGO. So yeah. I mean, very, very, very well served yeah. by all of these foreign NGOs, and so Incre- including uh, Christina Pusha, who was. Uh who was um, the spokesperson for, um, what's his name, uh, the, the Trump opponent. Why is his name escaping me? Uh, the, the, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. Yeah, yeah her, 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 his spokeswoman uh, was uh, a foreign agent for Georgia. And really? Involved wow. in the NGO scene. But, but yeah, so there is, it has an absolutely enormous and extremely bloated NGO sector, which, which, which to this day um, has an enormous impact on policy and, uh, on, on, and, and government action. Um, these, NGO, these NGOs that, that Shevard Nadze allowed were his undoing. And there is a whole section in this report about how um, in 1999, US funding helped Georgians draw up and build support for a freedom of information law, which the government adopted. This law allowed the media and NGOs to expose government misdeeds, force the firing of corrupt ministers, and give people a sense that they should regulate the government. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it, they, they also uh, they also uh, cultivated a large number of assets on the ground, including Mikhail Saakashvili, um, yeah. who was I think he was the justice minister um, under Shevard Nadze, and he quit uh, and then started. Um, uh, his own started making his own political ambitions very very clear. Um, well, we can talk about him. We can pause and talk about him really oh, no, quick we, because we he. Get, well, we okay. can get into it just, just really right. quickly. Sure. And so in this uh, in this Democracy Rising report, there is uh, an, an individual tied to the U.S. funded Liberty Institute states the success in Georgia uh, is the result of people's commitment to democracy. But without foreign assistance, I'm not sure we would have been able to achieve what we did without bloodshed. Um, and there is another quote uh, further on, which is um, from uh, from the start, USAID uh, uh, supported civil society and created a network of civic minded people who supported democracy and were ready to join the Rose Revolution in 2003. Um, another, another, a former Georgia a mayor in Georgia. It doesn't state where. Says with U.S. assistance, new leaders were born. The U.S. helped good people get rid of a bad and corrupted government. Yeah, and right. that led to the uh, rise of Saakashvili. Yes, uh, yes. who um, was? He's a uh, a a big um, investor in in Ukraine and the post Maidan government there. He was made the mayor of Odessa, Odessa yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, despite being the former prime minister of Georgia and yeah. not a Ukrainian national. I think that he was given like he was given citizenship, citizenship. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, I think as well, it's important to note that Saakashvili was, well, I, 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 I remember watching at university, like all of the, the all of the, the, the uh, media coverage around the war in Georgia in 2008, uh, which began when Saakashvili, with US encouragement, began striking um, civilian areas. In this two- is 2008, a video I'm playing right now. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he started shelling civilian areas in, um, uh, uh, there, there are some breakaway regions of uh, within Georgia that uh, they want, they claim independence, um, and but uh, Georgia wants them to be their own territory, and and under an international agreement with Russia, Russia, Russia are guarantors of their semi-independent kind of the grey area of like. I mean, uh, anyway, the the point is, is yes, so that 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 war started. Um, um, Georgia started, sorry, the Georgian government started it, and they did so with U.S. Um, uh, encouragement. Um, they were crushed within days um, by Russia. But um, it, it, Saakashvili was, at the time, um, presented as this uh, crusading, courageous Democrat standing up to Russian barbarism. Does this remind you of, of mm. anything, Alex? Um, and uh, and uh, in, reality, in reality, Georgia, under his rule, in many areas became even more 
um, autocratic. It became far more repressive. Prisons became uh, the, the politicised hotbeds of torture and rape. Mm. Um, he helped cover up a hideous murder orchestrated by one of his government ministers. And um, it, 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 yes, it, 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 he was no cuddly Democrat at all. Mm. He was voted out in 2012 fair and square, despite massive NED efforts to support him. And he was replaced by Georgia Dream, who've, re who've ruled ever since. Now, Georgia Dream are almost universally described in the Western media as pro-Russian or like Russian puppets. Sure. Actually, they have a very difficult balancing act, which is, on the one hand, they don't want to piss off Russia, which is their biggest trading partner, and uh, they're, they're far more powerful and much larger neighbour, mm. uh, because that I mean, it was disastrous for them before, so why would they want to do that? But they are pursuing EU membership. They've attempted, to, well, they haven't sanctioned Russia themselves, they have attempted to comply with Western sanctions regimes. And I think it's important to, yeah, so they, they are pursuing legislation, which is, I think it's called the Foreign Agents Act, or yeah. like, uh, Foreign Interference Act. But, the, but the, the purpose is to compel NGOs. Foreign the, Influence it, Transparency Law. Yeah, the Foreign in, in, Influence Transparency Law. The, the purpose is to compel any organization that receives foreign funding, even if it's from Russia, to compel, sorry, to publish um, where their funding comes from and how much it is. Um, at the start of 2023, when the government was was initially pushing for this, uh, there were mass demonstrations, um, uh, condemnations from uh, from US spokespeople uh, stating that this is not in line with our um, our vision for a future Georgia, i.e. don't do it or else. Yeah. Um, and then when protesters were on the verge of storming um, the uh, Georgia's parliament, just like in two, the 2003 Rose Revolution, the government backed down. Um, since then, they have claimed that there are, uh, they claim to have uh, vanquished a, a series of colour revolution attempts. There was a, um, uh, I think it was the end of last year, that <clears throat> they announced that, that there was a a plot by people around Saakashvili, including the head of the Georgian Legion, your, mm. your dear friend. Mamuka Mamoshvili, yeah. yeah, whose sister is in parliament there. Yeah, um, and they they, uh, they alleged, uh, Canvas, it was this, um, this shadowy regime change outfit, which is based in Serbia um, and grew out of Otpor, which is mm. an NED-funded group in Yugoslavia that was central to Milosevic's overthrow. Um, they, Its founders then started this company called Canvas, and they started training people yeah. overseas to... Including, I believe, people. Wang Guaido. Yes. yes yeah. 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 And there, there are some leaked documents um, project, released by WikiLeaks. Uh, it's, it's Stratfor, which is this yeah. shadowy private spying agency mm -hmm. staffed by ex-CIA people, or are they... Truly, X, right. and it's and um, there, there are internal discussions where Stratfor employees refer to Canvas as uh, as U.S. government funded and taking down governments the U.S. doesn't like, and when used correctly, they are more powerful than an aircraft carrier. Uh, so, quite why their activities haven't been just banned everywhere, I do not know. But they were allegedly involved um, in this effort last year to overthrow the Georgian government. So, I think that the, 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 it's important. The, the geopolitical context here is, is is important to note as well. Is that Georgian leaders have announced, or they've at least claimed, that they've been pressured aggressively behind closed doors to uh, open a new front in the war in Ukraine, to mm -hmm. arm Ukraine, and they have refused, which has not gone down well. So they are rather, um, uh, they're rather in the bad books of Zelensky and, uh, and Biden um, right. at the moment. So it's actually, in, it, 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 in terms of pushing for this legislation again, it's actually pretty brave. Um, right. There are, have been absolutely massive um, uh, uh, protests in the centre of Georgia over this, yeah. um, which show no sign of of, uh, of letting up. Um, it, it, what's quite remarkable is there's a very good article in Left East by um, that's up now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by uh, two um, individuals who really know their stuff um, on Georgia and the Caucasus, um, uh, and they have a very a very balanced, informed view. Again, I would urge viewers to read it. It's not it's not a, a long and overly detailed article. It's straight into the point. But um, yeah, the, the, it, 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 at the core of protesters' concerns is that this law will interfere with uh, Georgia's EU aspirations. Right. Now, it, it is important to note that 
Um, once the Georgian government dropped this legislation initially last year, the EU acknowledged rather quietly and, in, and, and embarrassedly, um, well, we're thinking of almost identical legislation for all EU member states. <laughs> so yeah. it would block your EU aspirations, but once joining, you would have to adopt exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, but, and, and I mean, they're, I mean, they're obviously like dangling the, 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 the tree in front of uh, Georgia as, as far as EU membership because yes. I mean you can't you can't have them be a member of the EU and also have it as like a testing ground for you know um, different styles of foreign interference yes. you know <laughs> um, yeah and we, we have I'm gonna bring up the tweet from uh, the, the prime, prime minister. minister yeah the, the, this is this is fighting words so this is the prime minister of Georgia who um, published a statement on Twitter. Feel free to read it, Alex. But he, he effectively go, goes in to detail about why they're doing this and how um, he thinks it's extremely hypocritical of the US to be condemning crackdowns on these protesters in Georgia while also sending armoured uh, thugs to destroy um, tent encampments on, on US, US university campuses. Uh, so... Um, Shoot from the top. Well, yeah, okay. I'll go, I'll go quickly because it's it's a bit long. But spoke to a uh, Department of State counselor and expressed my sincere disappointment with the two revolution attempts of 2020 to 2023 supported by the former U.S. ambassador and those carried out through NGOs financed from external sources. Uh, had these attempts been successful, the second front line would have been opened in Georgia. Um, besides, I explained to Mr. Cholet that... False statements made by officials of the U.S. State Department about the transparency bill and the street rallies remind us of similar false statements made by former U.S. ambassadors in 2020 to 2023, which served to serve to the facilitation of violence from foreign funded actors and to the support of revolutionary processes back then. Also, I clarified to Mr. Cholet that it requires a special effort to restart the relations against this background, which is impossible without a fair and honest approach. I have not expressed my concern with Mr. Cholet about a brutal crackdown of student protest rally in New York City. <laughs> Sassy. I like it. Um, but yeah, so I think that... And do you want to bring up your Mint Press article? Yeah, sure. I mean, not much to add really on what we've said. Whoever did this cover art did a fantastic Fantastic job. job. (laughs) I I think that it's it's important to note as well that what's interesting is, and this is a point made in the Left East article, is that the NGO at at the forefront of the unrest in 2023 were a large number of NGOs that were all in receipt of US funding. So for instance, there was a group called the Shame Movement, which was established to scrutinize laws passed by Georgian Dream um, and shame them. And so they were at the forefront of this initially, shaming them over the foreign agent legislation. Um, Those, so they're doing their NED, they they receive enormous amounts of of money from NED. uh, So they were just doing their job as the shadow CIA um, right. <laughs> instructed and directed them. This time round, there is a lot less obvious uh, NGO presence. And I think that there is a large number of Georgians because they have been misled into thinking that this is a, a crackdown on civil society uh, that, uh, and indeed does threaten their EU membership who are genuinely are, are committed and have you know, honest intentions, even if misguided. Um, at the same time, a large number of these people will, at some stage, because of the profusion of NGOs in Georgia, have been involved with them directly or indirectly. And there's also the fact that you know very well that if you are receiving money from the USAID or NED, there are things that you probably should do, have to do, can't yeah. talk about, etc. Right. Um, there are declassified CIA files from the 1940s that show that the CIA knew back then that, that providing funding to, for example, um, anti-communist activists in West Germany had a kind of ripple effect or aftershock effect where people who are no longer in direct receipt of funding will continue to engage in these activities because it's what they're meant to do. Um, and we see that today. Um, yes, that this is my article for, for Mint Press. It goes into some some, some detail um, on um, on the Rose Revolution and, and the, the events that led up to it, um, both within and without Georgia. 
Um, but yeah, I think that Georgia is it, but stuck between a rock and a hard place, really. Yeah. Uh, and it's uh, and it's quite remarkable to see them uh, standing up for themselves like this in the face of intensive U.S. pressure to drop it. Right. And I think you've got to bear in mind that there are a number of other countries which ha- are mulling um, uh, similar legislation and have likewise been threatened. Not far from where we are now, Republika Srpska, one of yeah. the components of, right. of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the government there is pushing for a foreign agent law and they've basically been threatened if that they do this there will be consequences um well, well it's, what... i mean it's natural i think for i mean and you, you see china's uh, done stuff of this nature too yes. but i think it's natural because you have uh these ngos which are getting funding from foreign governments that are playing games with very integral policies right mm. um policies which define a country um so if you want to have any kind of claim to sovereignty then you can't just let these actors these foreign actors like run rampant and 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 masquerade as uh as legitimate grassroots voices when they're getting you know millions of dollars from uh, outfits like the the National Endowment for Democracy. It's I mean, it's just basic statecraft. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing is that the, the Britain um, has passed legis- wide ranging legislation. I think we talked about this last week uh, called the National Security Act, which sure. is, goes way further than this. Yeah, right? and it's, right. it's, it's written so vaguely that like someone retweeting the Russian Foreign Ministry could end up in trouble like, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, that, yeah, it's, yeah. That, it's that sweeping this is literally just compelling organizations that receive foreign funding to disclose it and i might add as well that like the sickness of the ngo industrial complex um i'm coining that term if it doesn't exist already is it, it, is exemplified by the reaction to um to this last time round where the george soros open society foundation i think i'm gonna have to find the exact um uh, the exact phrasing because it was just so it was just so utterly shocking. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, they issued a statement uh, effectively um, it's st- warning that if you pass this um, if you pass this legislation, it will result in um, uh, yeah. Here we go. Um, that this bill will leave defenseless, abused children, and women, people with disabilities, minorities, scientists, workers, and the youth. It will result in assistance not being provided to socially vulnerable families um, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's like, so what you're saying is these organizations would rather abandon abused children and women than just admit that they receive foreign funding. Yeah, right. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it's and it's, that's so clearly a red herring, too, because like if, if, if it were the case that the, the, the United States was funding women's shelters in Georgia, you know, I don't think that many Georgians would necessarily have a problem with that, right? Yes. It's not. It's yeah. not women's shelters that are the issue here. Yes. Yeah. It's it's the policy uh, groups, the the, the activists, uh, the the the, the uh, street warriors, and and the um, the little offices that they hang out in after the protest. Yes, you indeed, know? indeed. Well, I mean, we, we we had a bit of that in Belgrade earlier this year. Uh, where the there was a large number of Western funded NGOs and groups who were claiming widespread electoral fraud right. um, in Serbia's general election, and but what one of the the, the kind of ironic boomerangs of the fact that, that the color revolutions were effectively birthed here is that the public are extremely wary. <laughs> so yeah. like, there was this organisation uh, called CRTA that publishes very detailed reports on election or alleged election rigging in Serbia and if you look at its funders it's like the NED USAID yeah. the US embassy in Serbia the yeah. British embassy in Serbia the British foreign office and it just goes yeah. on and on and on and like any Serb looking at that is like right well this is an attack on my country and yeah. I'm not going to listen to them right. so and I think that, that, that that's in, that's increasingly the attitude everywhere yeah. now and, and, and I mean like that's the thing this bill in Georgia is not saying that you cannot receive foreign funding if no. you're an NGO they're saying if you receive foreign funding you have to disclose it so there is no reason why it should be shutting down any NGOs, right? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, although, I mean, on the subject of um, sanctions, um, the we have uh, we have heard that Boeing, um, which seems to invest a lot more money in hitmen and safety, um, they they are claiming that one of the reasons they can't deliver 
um, 787 dream liners, quote unquote, or nightmare liners, um, is due to sanctions on Russia. Mm. Um, do you buy it, Alex? I don't. Um, I don't. Well, I mean, and this was like part of the thing, too, is I don't have the article up yet. No, uh, but okay. you were explaining to me that this was uh, a heating component, right? That that was uh, affected by these sanctions. And um, I don't understand why a heating component is uh, necessary to keep uh, a plane door from falling off. Yes, or a, or a plane window <laughs> yeah, um, popping right. uh, midair. Um, but yes, we've, we've had a second, a second uh, whistleblower death. Um, uh, first, there was a Boeing whistleblower who was testifying to was it the Senate or they were they giving a deposition? Mm. They were there was a, a Boeing whistleblower who was who was testifying uh, that Boeing deliberately cut corners on safety for the reasons of profit, and he told friends, "If I end up dead, I didn't commit suicide." And then, ooh, he's found dead from a gunshot wound in the boot of his car because that's exactly mm. how he would commit suicide is is where nobody sees it. Um, in, a, in a cramped, dark space, uh, but but yes, um, the, the a second whistleblower has now a, a second whistleblower's life claimed by a freak sudden onset infection. So yeah. we're at least getting more imaginative, right, um, with the stories. But um, you have a general interest in in planes. Um, well, I yeah, I'd like, I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk about this. Uh, this story really quick. This is in War is Boring. I think that's some kind of think tank's like uh, publication. Yeah. Um, but it's actually republished from the Dayton Daily News in Ohio. Uh, aviation maintenance, repair, and overhaul company Sierra Nevada has won an Air Force contract that will create work at Dayton International Airport in Beaver Creek. Uh, Sierra Nevada Corp., based in Englewood, Colorado, was awarded $13 billion cost plus incentive fee, fixed price incentive. And cost, well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> what, what does that even mean? Yes, um, sometimes called the doomsday plane, the center is meant to be a strategic command and control military aircraft used in war and in emergency situations. Uh, the doomsday plane, it is exactly what it sounds like it is. It is a plane designed to carry the president and the uh, the um, Department of Defense chief, the Secretary of Defense, in the event of a nuclear war. Um, th that way they are able to command the battlefield from the sky. Um, so what does this tell you about the direction that the elites are moving us in when they are now investing $13 billion in a, uh, in a new um, doomsday plane? Um, I have the Wikipedia page. I think if for... they gave it a cheerier name. I'm sorry. Like if they gave it a cheerier name, like people yeah. would be so worried. Like it's the happy place. Yeah, right, right. And like, there yeah, it's a branding issue. You get, so you get Frank Lund's The previous, uh, the previous version was um, actually manufactured by Boeing. Um, no surprise that uh, they have not got. They, they did not secure the new contract. Well, they, they like uh, they, they, like, they like the sound of the name Doomsday Plane. I think, right, Boeing. They were drawn to that. Yeah, I didn't realize that it actually had to be safe. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you can't have the president of the United States, you know, flying through the open window. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. So the this is the uh, the previous version. The E four serves as a survivable survivable mobile command post for the National Command Authority, namely the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, and successors. Uh, so it's got you know briefing rooms, meeting rooms, um, and so presumably child sex uh, chamber, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> piloted by Epstein. Right, I think yeah. like, that this is his, his new his new role. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's inter it's interesting as well that the, the the continuity of government government planning has been touched upon by this like really kind of emerged in the 1970s and then it, 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 it expanded massively under Reagan and they have all of these plans for, well, once the president dies, there will be six designated people who it, and it, it, it's ready to kind of this line of accession. So if the president dies, this person takes over. Yeah. If they die, this person takes over and so on. Um, there are also components of it that are like deeply disturbing, which are still extant as far as we know. It was originally called Debt Com, which meant detain communists. So there was a list of like hundreds of people who, in the event of war with the Soviet Union, would need to be jailed immediately in the, in the manner of Japanese sure. internment. Yeah. Um, they probably have a, lot, a much larger pool of people they want to jail now. 
Oh um, yeah, domestic extremists. Oh yeah, uh, the uh, that that phrase "beloved of Brit- the uh, British security and intelligence forces," which means absolutely, avowedly means absolutely nothing, uh, but also um, our friends in the Department of Homeland Security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So moving on, um, we have, uh, I believe, this week, if not uh, just a few days before this week, a twenty twenty four roadmap from the Department of Homeland Security um, on the use of artificial intelligence. And actually, Kit, you found something very interesting in here. Yes. Let's start with the Sure. The well, bio. I mean, they, they, they uh, when they're setting out the alleged threat um, inherent, um, <laughs> I mean, it's quite remarkable. They claim that AI can be used to combat fentanyl. Um, yes. Because, well, I mean, a, a, an AI police officer can't, you know, get drowsy by exposure to <laughs> the fentanyl. But, yeah. but, but there's a whole section on how uh, you know, the advent of AI may make it easier for malicious actors to develop weapons of mass destruction and other related threats. Of particular concern is the risk of AI-enabled misuse of synthetic nucleic acids to create biological weapons. Also, AI can be used to generate child sex abuse material. Um, uh, I mean, this is insane. This is completely... Read re- re- towards the end of this paragraph. Though. Okay. So, which... Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll read it. Similarly, while AI has already enabled innovation in the physical and biological sciences, it has also the potential to substantially lower the barrier of entry for non-experts to design, synthesize, acquire, use chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons. So, I think that uh, the case is closed on uh, the uh, weapons in Iraq, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> they were AI You're generated. Right. <laughs> but yeah, so I think... Just because it was a deep fake doesn't mean it was yeah, AI. Yeah, it wasn't real. That's yeah. why we couldn't find it. Like, right. it's just, I think that, that, that this is this entire document is like deeply disturbing and then it's a bit like when they're talking yeah, when they're talking about how ooh, AI can be used to make WMD. Hmm. I mean, it's not, you know, the, the top of my list in terms of threats i would think arising from ai but i mean it it, it it does seem like predictive programming like foreshadowing yeah of like oh well we need to crack down on on this because reasons i mean that the, the gchq britain's quote unquote signals intelligence agency which is does um, very, something very different um it, they uh i think it was in 2020 released a report where they effectively talked about how they wanted to harness um ai and then like the 99 percent of the report was about child protection and it's yeah. like that's obviously not what they're, sure. they're, they're, they're interested in yeah i mean there is i mean in, in terms of um uh, ai being used to generate child sex abuse material this will mean the fbi no longer has to force female interns who look young right. to pretend to be children yeah. to take revealing pictures which has happened many times um the fbi is the well the the dark web's biggest purveyor of child sex material and they use it for entrapment purposes and some of these pe- these these pervs who access this actually end up walking free because they successfully argue that they were conned into it by, by the fbi um, um of course the bureau f- has faced no no consequences as a result but but yeah the it, the specter of child protection is very very effective it's the kind of thing which the media would obviously just run with without asking much in the way of in the way of questions um the the we know for a fact that um uh the the, the dhs via uh scissor um or caesar um what which acron- pronunciation would you prefer alex uh let's say caesar caesar okay so you know, you know like the like the wu-tang yeah the caesar. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 the scissor like, yeah like, yeah, yeah. It's, um, on the cutting room floor i think like enter, <laughs> enter 36 chambers of ai but, the, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but, the, but there is a so we know for a fact that scissor is already heavily um uh, invested and, ex- and experimenting with um, artificial intelligence and like, big data tools. So there is a bunch of leaked documents, I believe, that were released by Ken Klippenstein, now formerly um, of The Intercept, That's right. which basically documented... So um, people may not remember, um, or they may have just suppressed it because it was so awful. Uh, about two years ago, the, D- the Department for Homeland Security announced that they were launching a disinformation governance board. Um, I mean, it's just like so Orwellian and 
like really <laughs> by uh, headed by your favorite uh, terrible musical enthusiast. Yeah, 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 headed by Scary Poppins, Miss um, Miss Nina Jankovic, um, who is now a, a on the Farah is a British um, asset. She is she's foreign agent. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the British, she, she's lobbying on behalf of uh, the Center for Information Resilience. This is another mm. um, terrifying uh, Orwellian. Like the Center for Information Resilience has come to give you a brain realignment, <laughs> like, 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 just like, and, and it's just like you know what could what could be what could be less threatening than that? And, yeah, and so she is on on Capitol Hill trying to raise funding and drum up business for this organization which is run by two longtime British intelligence operatives one of whom I have jousted with a lot and has called me a conspiracy theorist and complained about my use of run-on sentences amongst other things uh, his name is Ross Burley but these are these are two longtime British psychological warfare specialists the, um, the Disinformation Governance Board was announced with much fanfare, but with absolutely zero clarity on what it would and wouldn't do uh, two years ago. And then within, a, I think it was two or three weeks, it got shut down mm. because of the huge controversy, because it wasn't at all clear what it was meant to be doing um, or whether there would be whether it would be actively policing what people said online, whether it would be a censorship unit that was uh, demanding with menaces that Twitter et al remove content it didn't like and of course there is the burning question of what is dis disinformation um, and the answer is always information that powerful people do not want in the public domain um, almost without exception and so there are these leaked files related to the disinformation governance board which show that despite the fact that it got shut down the uh, in theory the underlying infrastructure behind it which was run by CISA um, had been going for a long time and indeed carried on after the board's dis dissolution um, publicly and it, the, it, the, the, the files document how by the time of the board's launch the, the scissor was using a quote-unquote social media aggregation tool mm -hmm. produced by tangles which was created by cobwebs a company founded by a former israeli occupation force uh, sorry by former israeli occupation force cyber warfare specialists um and it is already widely used by u.s law enforcement and it's it's, it's head of sales is a for, formerly a, a connecticut police department chief um and 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 yeah the, in effect this is a social media spying tool which yeah. is not available for general use and has all sorts of rather terrifying applications and capabilities for um, uh, spying on what people are saying publicly and privately uh, and scissors already been using it mm -hmm. I mean no reference to um, weapons of mass destruction and child porn in, sure. in, 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 in these in the no world. it's it's it's, it's cl very clearly directed at uh, speech yes. um, I, and just and also just but, but I mean beyond speech like just just dissent as well like, yeah I mean it's it, 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 it is about monitoring who is organizing protests who is attending them like and all sorts because again yes such as the trajectory we are on elites are extremely frightened um, and they know that their 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 days are numbered yeah just to give a little anecdote because I you know I, I really want to put this in into perspective yes. for people um, when I worked at uh, RT America um, mm -hmm. back in uh, let's say uh, 2015 I believe um, we had uh, for the purposes of news gathering uh, access to an application called data miner which was very expensive uh, data miner is of course used by intelligence agencies has mi6 people on its board yeah so i would go out and i, I set my data miner settings to find protest related things on social media um, that was how i personalized my my profile yes. on it and i would go out and i would cover protests and when i whenever i filmed something particularly spicy i would hit the post thing the post button on twitter and within moments i would have no retweets yet and i would see a notification on data miner for my own tweet um this is you know fall or while i'm following around things like black blocks and antifa and so yeah. on shutting down highways and and whatnot now that was like 2015 2016 
That was before the advent of artificial intelligence. Well, not yeah. the advent, but you know, before it really became as sophisticated as it is today. And we see there's a there's a British company which I have some reporting on uh, coming um, called Logically, which yeah. uses artificial intelligence to consume all social media posts. Basically, every public social media post, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter. The entire fire hose, as it were. The right? entire fire hose. Um, so, I mean, that that's the kind of uh, targeting, uh, mass consumption and, 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 and targeting that becomes possible with um, these kinds of things. So Yeah, I mean, I might add about data miner as well. I mean, this is something that I wrote back, uh, all, almost a year to the day uh, for MinPress sure. on data miner. That it, what, what, what's really quite remarkable is uh, people may remember, or again, such as the pace that, that events move these days, they may have forgotten, that in April 2023, former CIA director Michael Morell admitted that he had orchestrated the letter um, the joint letter that torpedoed the New York Post's reporting on Hunter Biden's laptop. Now, again, um, this was a, a pretty fraught and, and frenzied time, but this was a joint letter signed by a variety, I think it was 51 former senior intelligence officials, um, who endor they endorsed this joint letter, which stated, while we have no evidence to suggest this is the case, we think that the Hunter Biden laptop is Russian disinformation. Yeah. Or it's the result of a Russian disinformation campaign. And it, it, this letter was cited by Biden when Trump grilled him about the, this on the campaign trail. Sharing of the Hunter Biden laptop story was banned on social networks. People who shared it got banned. Um, and and New, the New York Post Twitter account got banned as well um, temporarily. Yeah, but and was that's reinstated right. due to due to backlash. And uh, Morell has admitted that yes, that like that this was this was explicitly to help Biden. It was an October. It was a reverse October surprise because the stuff on that laptop is absolutely incendiary and it's been completely forgotten now. But the point is, is that I by doing an um, enormous amount of uh, Googling, <laughs> found that a, a, a large number of these people who signed this letter, uh, this joint letter, were connected to a shadowy consultancy firm called Beacon Global Strategies, which is effectively the parent company of Data Miner. Yeah. Now, this raises the very... And they're charged with marketing it and... So, so many it. CIA ops get laundered through consultancy firms. Yes, yes absolutely. I mean, what's the, what was that firm that Obama C worked for? Oh, that was business. the Business International Corporation. Sure. Uh, right. Yeah, but the... Uh, it, 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 but the, the point, sorry, the point is, is, yeah, that like most most of the senior CIA and NSA and Pentagon people who signed th this joint letter were connected to Beacon. Now, this raises, at least from my perspective, a very obvious question of whether the suppression of the, Biden, the Hunter Biden laptop story was just one component of something much bigger and more sinister. Mm. Were was data miner used to look at the people who were sharing this? Like because data miner effectively allows you to break down who this person is connected to, who they, who who particular social media users yeah. um, communicate with, yeah. and all this other stuff. And it's like, well, I mean, was that that aspect of it just, I mean, ensuring that literally no reference to this was made online and just like really drilling down and censoring and banning anyone who took an interest in this. Bearing in mind that Data Miner also has a contract with the FBI. Yeah. And the the Biden administration came into office clearly wanting to just completely neutralize Trump Trump and his supporters. Was there an offline component too, with the bureau look, tasked with looking into the kind of people who were sharing this stuff? Because it was that was that it was that radioactive. Yeah, and I, that is the, the the profusion of people tied to Beacon and and therefore Data Miner who were the were signatories of this letter is like really quite disconcerting. And it raises very obvious questions, which, of course, have not been asked in the mm. mainstream media. Because why would they? It's not their job. Yeah. Yeah. It's our job. <laughs> I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> do we do we want to move on to sabotage or do we yeah, want to? I think, I think then we should wrap up to that. But the, okay, the, the, yeah. The, uh, I, yeah. So <clears throat> it, I mentioned the National Security Act earlier. We have the first prosecutions under it and it only came into effect at the end of last year. So they're clearly in a hurry. Um, several people in Britain have been accused 
of plotting uh, to uh, carry out arson attacks against Ukrainian po uh, po uh, Ukrainian post office company. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, sorry, or a, a I think we're on different articles here because what? I have Financial Times Russia plotting sabotages across. No, 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 no I was just this is this is this is background. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So, like, so, so <laughs> we have we have at least one of us does our research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've, I've done my homework. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Homework. But the but the but the, yeah. The, the, so there have been, and I think in Germany, I think it's Germany as well. There have been people who are now being prosecuted for allegedly pl planning arson attacks on the offices of a Ukrainian mail delivery company. And then as if on cue, we now have the FT announcing that European intelligence uh, are warning that Russia is plotting sabotage uh, attacks across the continent. Now, um, this is pretty incredible timing. Uh, one can only wonder whether um, these people who were allegedly... Um, uh, had been tasked by Russia to do this were set up in the manner of, of pretty much every US terror plot in history by by, by uh, um, European intelligence agencies and indeed whether this is offering kind of a, a preemptive cover for when um, Ukrainians pissed off at their country's betrayal start um, carrying out mass casualty attacks and, yeah. you know, maybe WMD attacks as well right a AI, AI chat yeah. GPT um, <laughs> assisted uh, radio I feel, radio I feel like I feel like reading a chat GPT essay is already like some already some form of like terror attack yeah, yeah. Mind, you know? <laughs> yes indeed or a, or a Thomas Friedman article I mean, it's, that's right yeah so yeah but I mean so if, if, you, if you've got the article up there please feel free to go over it yeah, uh, European intelligence agencies have warned their governments that Russia is plotting violent acts of sabotage across the continent as it commits to a course of permanent conflict with the West. Interesting that they would uh, start planning terror attacks as they are winning the war in Ukraine. Yeah, you would think that they would have started off with with that. Um, and, you know, I just to bring up, uh, I did that report uh, last year sometime on uh azov fighters uh people linked to azov in italy yes. uh planning attacks on police stations and shopping malls um so that's the kind of and you did you did an article in a similar vein yeah, did you yeah. not yeah no, i specifically drew on your reporting because yeah. it's like it, it is it is astonishing because we are starting to get a trickle covert of, bombings arson go ahead no no yeah sorry that we are starting to get a trickle of of media reports of uh, fascist mercs returning to Europe or fascists in Europe with ties to Azov yeah. plotting mass casualty terror attacks. Right. Um, the Every warning light is blinking red and you, Western officials are not saying anything about it. They're rather sweeping this under the rug. There was a report from the British Parliament's uh, Intelligence and Security Committee, which was heavily redacted in its states that People returning from X who have been fighting X will have made contact with people uh, possessed of similar um, ideologies and been exposed to extremists and will have international connections. I mean, no prizes for guessing where they've been fighting and who they've been fighting. Mm. Uh, and it explicitly states there is no mechanism for dealing with this. Um, that presumably remains the case now. Um, it, it, it is deeply disturbing. There was at the very end of um, uh, in the I think it was Baltimore. Yeah. So in in February uh, 2023, there was two American neo Nazis who were the leaders of Atomwaffen, which yeah. is also known as the National Socialist Resistance Front, had planned to destroy elect electrical substations in Baltimore, Maryland, which yeah. is an extremely poor majority black city. Uh, near Washington DC as it happens and they intended to deprive residents of heat and light during winter which would be literally fatal like, on sure. a mass scale yeah. um, and th they, th despite the fact that the Biden administration has been talking a lot about the threat of right wing domestic extremism yeah. um, they said nothing about this um, and a very obvious uh, explanation is that they have direct ties to Azov and yeah. have attended their training camps yes yeah, and that's that's that's, that's that's documented. Um, so Financial Times, uh, Russia has already begun to more actively prepare, prepare covert bombings 
Hmm. Mm. Covert bombings, huh? Such as their own pipeline. Yes, um, indeed. Arson indeed. attacks and damage to infrastructure on European soil directly and via proxies with little apparent concern about causing civil- civilian fatalities, intelligence officials believe. Um, while the Kremlin agents have a long history of such operations, what history? We don't know. We they don't won't know. tell us. No. Um, <laughs> and launched attacks sporadically in Europe in recent years. What are, what could what I mean? Do you have any I mean, theories like, on what they like, might be talking about they're, here? They're like, I mean, probably this poisoning of Skripal, which one hundred percent wasn't MI six, or a, a covert bombing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, odd. Um, or arson. Arson, yeah. Or that, damage that, to infrastructure. It's, it's uniquely Russian tactic arson, I think. Yeah, and it's like you know. The Great Fire of London was Russians. Evidence is mounting of a more aggressive and concerted effort, according to assessments from winning. three different... Yeah, when they're winning, of course. Um, always uh, resort to terrorism when you're winning. I believe Sun Tzu said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> oh, it's called warfare. So, I mean, this is clearly, like, setting the stage for blaming Russia, as yes. you as you said, for any kind of blowback that may come from the promises made to Ukraine and the promises broken to Ukraine uh, from the uh, nine, ten years of arming and training and supplying uh, hardcore neo Nazis um, who are in a losing battle. Yeah, well, I think it's important to note as well that like the the unaccountably vast weapon shipments that have gone to to Ukraine, like like Europol, the U- Europe's police force, have like raised real concerns about this and said it they are already in black market. Um, oh arms, yeah, like, arms trade. Um, we have no way of knowing what they'll be used for. Um, and I, I got you, you, again. We are in the Balkans. Uh, the, the the a similar strategy was. Um, uh, applied by the U- by the CIA and MI6 in the in the Balkan Wars, where they funneled in breach of a, a UN embargo, uh, huge weapon shipments. And one of the reasons that, that, to the Bosniaks and the Croats, and they one of the reasons they were so huge was they knew that the second they landed, about half was was taken as a transit tax and then sold off. Yeah, and right. they are used to this day. Um, in bank robberies and mass shootings and and, and by organised crime, um, I, I think that there is a, a very big aspect of the intelligence services actively wanting this, right? Yeah. Because it, throughout the Cold War, the CIA and MI6 operated uh, something known as Operation Gladio, where 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 they armed uh, and trained and directed fascist paramilitary groups. Uh, all over Europe to carry out uh, assassinations, bombings, etc. The purpose was uh, to create something called a strategy of tension Mm. where people would turn to the state for greater security and they would accept police and military in the street in profusion and their and their communications being read um, in return for safety well I mean and you talk again talking about covert bombings there's the Nord Stream there's the car bomb aimed at uh, Alexander Dugan, yes. killed his daughter. There's the uh, the cafe bombing uh, that was done in uh, Saint Petersburg against yeah. uh, some some war blogger. I yeah, forget the name. I, I I did a Gray Zone article about it. Uh, you have uh, there was another car bombing. I mean, this is Ukraine's mo. It's not Russia's, um, and there's really no reason why they I mean, would. There was also the. This is rather forgotten. There was like the truck bombing. Of Kirk Bridge, yeah, like there was right. some poor truck driver died in it. I mean, it's been completely yeah. got it, yeah, yeah, admitted it, yeah. Um, and I think that there is the, uh, the, 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 the during in Northern Ireland, which was another Gladio esque dirty war run by the British intelligence services. Um, they uh, patented something called the human bomb strategy, where they would force through threats and coercion. Um, people to uh, get into a drive a car full of explosives into a military checkpoint yeah. and then when this happened they would claim oh this is a terror attack and there would be a mass crackdown but on that bombshell um, I think that we're rapidly approaching two hours so um, yeah, it's I, time to sign I, I would ju- I would just final thought yes. um, you know there's precedent for the mass disappearance of weapons from Ukraine it happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union yes. when $300 billion worth of weapons went missing. Yes. Um, but uh, to our viewers, uh, we apologize for all of the technical issues that we've been having. I um, want to thank you personally for uh, tuning in on Twitter today. Yeah. We were not on YouTube or Rumble. I know some of you are disappointed about that. We will upload a, 
a, a, a recording of this stream to those platforms and hopefully have things uh, better sorted next week. I uh, We're going to also, I know that the audio is low. We're going to increase the volume. Uh, if, if you're having trouble hearing us, you can find a better version there. Um, and, you know, just bear with us while we're trying to set everything up for success here. Um, we hope you enjoyed the show. And again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, give us a like on uh, subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, all the all the normal stuff. So um, again, thanks for watching, guys. Cheers, guys.